I just want to give a quick thanks to the Tier 5 channel members and patrons. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Sergeant Puma, Cat Crab Lobster, and Duck Machine. Thank you very much for the support. It is much appreciated. Story number one. Humans are weird. Out of joint. Written by Betty Adams. Are you quite sure that the harness traits are within the human's lifting tolerances? Forthclick asked, his wings twitching a bit as he settled himself on a perch beside the base commander. They are far under the tolerance levels for even the weakest of humans, Commander 57 Click stated with a curt tone into his voice. When I suggested bringing in a lift, the human nearly had a fit laughing. Forthclick didn't respond but let his eyes track the human who was currently organizing the storage compartments. The planet that they were on was shifting into what the humans called a monsoon season, while the storage compartment was rated for the wing-ripping force of the winds. The design involved a bit too much flexibility to allow for storage in the outer surface when the walls started pulsing with the wind songs of the planet. Therefore, all of the storage shelves along the walls were being disassembled and reconstructed for extra structural support, and their contents were being distributed throughout the base. Of course, the humans were an unstoppable aid in this process. They could have never gotten it done without their help. From everything they heard, the humans' own base construction had taken a different tactic. The outer shell of their base was completely rigid, several wingspans thick, and reinforced with several layers of rock that had been pulverized, suspended in liquid, and then sprayed over the framework. It was a style of construction that would only apply to a creature with the human's rock-like bones, he was sure. Finally, Commander 57 Clicks noted his deliberate silence and glared over at Fourth Click. In reply, Fourth Click shrugged and aimed his eyes on the human. Commander 57 Clicks gave an almost petulant growl and followed his gaze. The massive human was just then approaching the shelf where the crates of harnesses were. One massive arm swung in a steady rhythm to provide balance. The other arm was clutched to his side as if he was carrying a datapad that there was no datapad to be seen. The human reached the rapidly dwindling supply of crates on that wall. That near the edge of the compartment, the human's thick hair nearly brushed the ceiling. The human reached up as if to grab the box, but just before his hand made contact, the human paused and grunted in what was a very clear pain. It was a short moment. No one would have noticed it unless they happened to be looking at the human at the right moment. What human nonsense is this? Commander 57 Clicks demanded with a distinct clicking together of his teeth. Mustn't grind your teeth. Both clicks reminded him gently, only to get a rather sour look in response. The human had reached the box and lifted it down into his center of mass with another pained grunt. Commander 57 clicks hissed at that and fourth click whistled through his teeth in agreement. Humans only bothered centering mass when it was well past the mass of the flight harnesses in the crates. I will investigate this, Commander 57 clicks said in a grim tone. What's got you in such a flit? Both clicks asked in surprise. Overloaded, almost labeled crates are hardly something to get fluffed over. The crates are exactly what they are saying, Commander 57 clicks stated. The humans concealing an injury. What? Both clicks demanded. That would be childlike and foolishness. Yet, when he looked back over at the human, clutching the relatively small crate to the center of mass, he had to agree that it did fit the observed data better than his theory. Probably a minor flange injury, Commander 57 Clicks went on. I've been told that such injuries are considered so minor for them that it essentially all medical intervention is either useless or counterproductive. The only thing to do is completely rest the appendage. So why isn't he resting? Four Clicks demanded. A quirk of human nature, Commander 57 Clicks said with a wave of his wing. They consider something that is such a small proportion of their mass important in direct proportion to its size. They take it as an affront against the nature of things that their entire mass could be rendered non-functional by a malfunction of such a tiny part. How very human, both clicks said with a wry chuckle as they took flight and swept over to where the human had just placed the crate on the hover transport. Ranger Cram! 
Commander 57 Click snapped out, dropping his voice so that the human could hear him better and shouting, You are to rest your injured finger, and if that means resting the whole of your body, you will do it. The human jumped and looked up at them with a wide-eyed expression before turning his head to the side, giving them a view of the freakish white area and the eyes interlaced with blood vessels. Fourth Click tried to hide his shudder. He could almost swim in those eyes. My finger is completely uninjured, Ranger Cram said quickly, holding up his hands and flexing them for the base commander. They did appear to be completely functional. Then what? The commander demanded as he swept forward and landed on the human shoulder. Part of you is damaged. Nothing is damaged, the human insisted. Not really. Not really, Commander 57 clicks pressed. The human heaved a massive sigh and it seemed to be trying to rival the storm outside. And his arms folded around to rubber point about halfway from his legs to his neck. Well, uh, one of my ribs are out of sorts. He admitted with a grudging tone, hurts a bit and slows me down, but uh, one of the things we're keeping working really is no worse for me when the resting would be. Best to just keep working around it till the Cairo gets here in a week or two. Please explain that adverb, Commander 57 clicks interjected. What do you mean by your rib being out? The human paused and his face worked as he tried to explain what was clearly a simple term to him. Finally, he held up his hands, made them into fists, and placed one over the other before flaring his fingers. So, uh, one of my ribs, he said slowly, slipped out of where it's attached to the vertebra as if off kilter. Both of the wing let out horrified shrieks and darted into the air. The human winced at the sound and glanced at them uneasily as they darted around. Your spine is misaligned, Command 57 clicks, finally calmed himself down enough to confirm even as he gave a discreet wing signal for fourth clicks to contact the human commander. They were going to need backup on this issue, no doubt. The human groaned and raised his hands to rub his face. Look, he said, it's not a big deal for us. I'll just be in a bit of pain until, um, sit down, snapped the base commander. The human heaved another sigh and gave a longing look at the half-empty shop before slowly lowering his massive frame onto the hovering transport. It's no big deal, he muttered in protest once more. End of story. Story number two. Titanium Obelisk, written by I. R. Good at Writing. While within the borders of the Zocosed Republic, there was a world blackened by soot and pitted by craters. In this world, nothing but a whistling wind and a groan of decaying cities was heard. A titanium obelisk stood silent at the bottom of the deepest crater. Automated drones surrounded the monument, always working to keep the blowing ash from burying it. On its three faces, the following words were inscribed in a zocosed common. This monument belongs to Earth, gone from existence, but not from our minds. It is a beacon of legends and heroes, and not ours, but mankind's. Let it serve as a reminder of debt that can never be repaid to a race whose thoughtless story will never fade. Through transmission and reports, we did learn of how they made our oppressors burn. When the oppressors first came to the Zakozid, we fought and bled, and millions were left dead. Our governments collapsed, the people left helpless. A future of labor and toil became doubtless. Rebellion was futile and out of the question. Zirconians were killed for any transgression. To the four corners of the quadrant we were sent, under the oppressor's whip, and this was our torment. But between the beatings and the lashings we had heard, of a people whose wrath the oppressors incurred. With a declaration from its leader, mankind went to war, and our masters scoffed, never losing a battle before. A mighty armada of warships was prepared, another victim of their brutality they ensnared. To battle they went, convinced of victory. Humanity, just another footnote in history. The fighting was ruthless, the death tolls obscene. Unlike anything 
the oppressors had foreseen. Both were battered, but the war went on, not ending until one side was gone. One day we received our new directive to put the oppressors in a different perspective. It was from mankind, the contents encoded and mysterious. When it was deciphered, we knew that it was serious. We are losing this fight. It's a matter of months. Attack the oppressors. A war on two fronts. The Zirconians across the quadrant went into a panic. The implications of the message were titanic. But mankind was right. This was our chance to break the chains and go on the advance. In every planet, station, and ship, we declared ourselves free and fought to end the oppressor's rule for eternity. Our liberty was won, but the price we did pay. Earth still fell. Our grief these words cannot convey. And so this monument stands in what remains of our oppressor's homelands. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, 